Welcome to the Everyday Miracles podcast, where real life stories of hope and inspiration are shared. Every day, miracles are happening all around us, yet we rarely hear anything about them. Why is that? I'm Julie Hedenborg, and I've committed my time and energy to bring these stories to you, including some of my own personal experiences. My hope is that you'll be impacted the same way that I was. Join me in my journey to inspire change in a world that so desperately needs it. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Everyday Miracles podcast. I'm Julie Hedenborg, and be ready to be inspired today. Um, I have a guest who has been on other platforms. Actually, I have some listeners that sent him to me. It's like, Julie, you've got to hear this. You've got to, you've got to interview this man. Um, my guest today is amazing and he's going to bless you. Um, part of his story is remarkable supernatural pieces, um, have con- remarkable supernatural pieces. So um, I know a lot of people, your hair is going to be on fire to hear those. And I get that, but I encourage you to listen to the entire interview because what this man has to say is so powerful and it's just going to bring you peace and joy, uh, such a, he's inspiring me in so many ways. So, um, today my, my guest is Mike Olson and he is a fellow Kentuckian, uh, my home state. Um, he's from Louisville, Kentucky. He's married to Patty and a little bit about Mike that I want to share. Um, and I do want to give a shout out to Stephanie and Patricia. I know you guys were two that, that sent me Mike's testimony. Thank you for that. Um, he has uh, been through a lot in the last, how many years, Mike? Eight years? This started? Yes, that going on eight, yeah. Yeah, he has been through a lot. Um, he has had a near-death experience, and he, he has received a new set of lungs, and he was able, yes, he was able to go to heaven, and he was able to meet his organ donor, and it's phenomenal. Um, there are angels, there are uh, little pieces of... Um, he's had a multiple visions, confirmations. Um, the Holy spirit is laced all throughout the story. So, um, lots of pieces to this, um, but a little bit on Mike, um, your background is really interesting to me. Uh, you were actually in New York at a prestigious college. Uh, you were studying acting and dance and um, your creative type guy, um, yeah. in your late teens and the Lord called you into ministry. So you left all of that fun, exciting New York, totally changed your life. You invited Jesus to come into your heart and he did and came into your life. You get married to Patty. You overcome some really hard things in your youth, um, abuse and different things. Um, you end up, um, going from being a Catholic and you're into this new church, um, as in pastor Iona community church in Louisville. And um, you said at one interview that you were kind of regarded as the hippie pastor. (laughs) So we'll get to that. I think that's so interesting, but you're such a passionate guy. You have such a heart for people. Um, Things are going well. And then um, you start having some breathing difficulties, go to the doctor and they tell you that you have two years left to live, to go home, make arrangements that um, even though you've never smoked um, or you're not a smoker, um, this was no fault. It just kind of happened. And then your life takes this crazy turn. I'll just start like probably um, right when I got diagnosed, maybe a little before that. And just to give you an idea of what my life's like. Yeah. And uh, so I guess, um, you know, I was raised in a a Catholic home and uh, I always tell everybody I knew Jesus in my head, but he hadn't reached my heart. And uh, that's a, that's a big deal. We can have religion, but God wants a relationship. Yeah. And so uh, my whole life, I was searching for that and found it uh, when I was a young man, uh, I was 19 years old, gave my heart to the Lord and uh, it's been a journey ever since. So I had that foundation of being with the Lord. So when things uh, took a turn in my life, uh, I had that foundation of knowing Jesus. So, so back in 2014, um, well, actually 2012, there was an ice storm here in Kentucky and uh, it was so bad that our electric was off for two weeks. And uh, we had a little wood stove in the living room at the time and we had several dogs. And so we kind of laid a mattress down on the floor in the living room by the wood stove. 
And, uh, you know, we were, I don't think we were even working at that time because we couldn't even get to our jobs. That's how bad the storm was. So anyway, we, we uh, laid on this mattress with all the dogs and uh, tried to keep as warm as we could, keeping that wood stove fired up. But unfortunately, I took a toll on my health and uh, I got pneumonia and uh, went to the ER and uh, they said, uh, you have pneumonia. So, you know, I didn't think anything of it, you know, just give me some meds and I'll be on my way and, you know, hopefully recover. And, uh, but the problem was I was, I was getting bronchitis, uh, since we moved to Kentucky, I was probably getting bronchitis twice a year, uh, every year, you know? So, uh, so I got to pneumonia and then I was going to an allergist and he goes, you can't keep coming here that you have bronchitis like all the time. We can't keep on giving you antibiotics. So uh, he sent me to a pulmonologist and uh, went to the pulmonologist and he said, uh, listen, you got a interstitial lung disease and we need to watch this and see what goes on with this for the next, you know, six months or so. And so, you know, we were watching it, but my health was declining. I was short of breath and uh, really mystified on why I was feeling so terrible. And so I went back to the pulmonologist and he said, listen, we need to do an open lung biopsy. I have a feeling what it is, but I need to confer what it is. So we did the open lung biopsy and lo and behold, uh, they diagnosed me with uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is uh, there is no cure. Uh, your lungs deteriorate, they honeycomb, uh, they just uh, kind of shrivel up and and uh, die. And so my doctor pulled me aside and, and I was, well, I'm happy, go lucky, trust in the Lord. That's how it's always been. And uh, he's like, we, we need to have a serious talk here. And I'm like, okay. And he goes, no, serious. This is like worse than cancer, what you have. And he goes, you only have two years to live. Well, wow, you just, I'm like, okay, I start crying. I'm like, did you get what you want? Cause I'm crying now, I, you got my attention. Uh, so yeah, I, I was diagnosed with the, the terminal lung disease and right after the biopsy was done, I was put on oxygen 24 seven. And uh, that was my life for several years. But, you know, I always tell everybody when something happens to you in your life, you can get bitter about it or you can get better. You can choose, make a, a conscious choice that what am I going to do now, now that I got this diagnosis, now that I, my life has changed and things look really awkward and, and, and painful and, and I, I don't like this type of thing. So I got the diagnosis, put on oxygen. And, you know, the first thing I did was run to the Lord, literally I went into a, I have a chapel in my backyard in this old cabin and I, I just cry out to God. And I said, you know, a lot of times people go, God, you know, I did this for you. I did this for you. Why are you doing this? Start bargaining, bargaining with God. And I was like, no, God, what's the word that you have for me? What can I cling to? What can I hang on to? What are you trying to say here? Uh, obviously you let this happen or you knew it was going to happen, let's say that. Hey, God doesn't give us sickness, but he knew this was going to come into my life. And so I just heard the words, trust me, just trust me. I'm like, wow, you know, it, it wasn't spectacular and fireworks were going off, but it was two words that calmed me down. Now, I'm the type of person that I you know, before this, I would have anxiety attacks and, uh, and, you know, sleepless nights. And, and when God told me, trust me, I, I knew I could, I could trust him. I knew I could hang on to that word. So I, I decided to trust him. And I was in such supernatural peace from that point on. Didn't matter what the doctor said. He said, I was dying at two years to live and I'm on oxygen I mean, just like talk about, you know, total, you know, transformation and in, in a normal life, you know, flow, working and 
and going to church and you know doing the things that we normally do but it gave me a supernatural peace that passes all understanding that guarded my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. So that's the beginning of what happened. So I decided I'm not going to get bitter. I'm going to get better. So I said, what can I do? What can I do now, even though I'm sick and terminally ill? Well, what can I do? And, you know, of course, as Christians, you know, we gathered a lot of people to pray. I probably had thousands of people praying for me. And, you know, those prayers, you know, I wasn't getting healed, per se, uh, of the lung, terminal lung disease. But boy, was I being infused with, uh, I don't know, I don't know how to put it, but those prayers kept me floating, like, like nothing bothered me, you know, it was was like, it was just total uh, peace, you know, that I, I, in my situation. So I decided, okay, I can help others who can't breathe. I can help others who are just so scared and, and not, no, no, not knowing what to do. I had to step down from the pulpit and retire from the ministry. And I thought, well, I'm a minister. I can still minister in other ways. So I put my stuff out there on all the blogs and all the, the uh, uh, support groups for pulmonary fibrosis. And I said, you know, I don't know if you're believers or not, but, you know, I'm a pastor here and I'd be willing to pray for you, talk to you. And, and so I put my stuff out there and it was interesting. I just wanted to share this one story. Um, so this young man, younger than I, it was, I think he was in his thirties, late thirties. And his name was Ruben, from Texas. And he reached out to me one time and, and he said, Hey, Mike, I, I don't know what to do. I'm, you know, I'm just kind of scared. And, and, uh, I have pulmonary fibrosis. I have a hole in my heart and all this stuff. And one night he called me and uh, he was, uh, I think he was a little intoxicated because that's where he turned to. Yeah. But, uh, and uh, so he called like three in the morning or something, you know, here I am. I, I go, here's my phone number. Call me anytime. But, you know, with that comes the responsibility of getting yeah. up at three in the morning and answering that phone call. And, uh, you know, I could have ignored that phone call, but I really felt like, no, he needs me. So, so I picked it up and he was, he's crying and sobbing and he goes, how do you do it? I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to cope with this. And I said, Ruben, listen, I go out and do what I do because I was meeting with politicians and celebrities to bring awareness to this disease. And uh, I said, you do what you can do. And so he took me up on it and he started, no kidding, this guy He's kind of buff, really good looking guy. He started uh, doing uh, 5K runs with his oxygen tanks. Um, And so he inspired me, man. He was going all over Texas, doing all these marathons and and really making a difference. And I later learned that he talked to my wife, texted to her, I think it was. And he said, it wasn't for Mike uh, meeting me at three in the morning, praying for me. I was ready to commit suicide that night. Um, and so I, I always tell everybody, you know, listen to people. You know, they might not be perfect. Like he was intoxicated. He was you know, really upset. But you know what? I didn't judge him for that. I just thought, he just go past all that. What does God want in his heart and his life? So he went on to do all these marathons and, you know, fought the good fight. He lost his battle with pulmonary fibrosis. And, uh, but boy, did he go out with a, you know, a, a winning smile and a grateful heart. And he made a difference in his uh, community. So, uh, so anyway, that was one of the things I did. And also, you know, what I did before transplant, before this heavenly encounter, I uh, decided, I, hey, you know what? I'm going to meet with, uh, you know, politicians. I don't care what side of the aisle they're on. They need to learn about pulmonary fibrosis. So I went and met with the mayor of Louisville, the governor of Kentucky. I met with uh, Rand Paul, Mitch McConnell, all the big weeks in, uh, in Washington, you know, just me, this little podunk pastor in Kentucky is meeting with these people. It's, it was crazy. So uh, I was, and then I met with Dennis Quaid. He was an actor. I sang on stage with my oxygen and uh, I sang a whole lot of shaking going on, which was a kind of funny song to sing 
because that's what my life was like. It was being shaken. Yeah. But uh, the, the Lord, you know, I, I, as a pastor, I was like, I'm going to sing in this bar in Lexington. And I felt like the Lord said, yeah, go sing. So I did and uh, was able to touch people in, in that area as well. So anyway, my last kind of hurrah, my wife said, hey, uh, Vice President Pence is gonna be over in Lexington doing a rally. And I'm like, well, I'm not really political, but uh, yeah, okay, I'll go. You know, when your wife says something to do, you know, you better obey. So <laughs> I went over to Lexington and I, I thought it was gonna be a meet and greet, shake the Vice President's hand and, uh, take a photo op, you know, and that was going to be it. Yeah. So I get there and um, all of a sudden, uh, I'm the last in line, you know, there was policemen, firemen, different kind of people in line to meet the pre uh, vice president. And I'm the last guy. And so I get up, get up to him and secret services all around him. And, and the funny thing was, let me backtrack. I had called Washington because I didn't want to be just just go to this rally and not meet the vice president. Yeah. So I called I call Washington and I called Mitch McConnell's office because I had already met him at a uh, uh, American Lung Association gala. And so I call his office and they switched me over to the vice president's office. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is so weird. So I get on the phone with the vice president's office and they said, Oh, Pastor Mike Olson from Louisville, Kentucky. I said, yeah, that'd be me. And they go, oh, we know who you are. I'm like, oh, no, I'm in trouble. And, and they said, no, seriously, uh, we're watching the Mike Olson Project documentary right now in the office. And Senator Rand Paul came in and was just talking about you. I'm like, oh, my goodness, they're talking about me in Washington. So anyway, we, uh, I went to the rally and uh, met with President uh, Vice President Pence, and he comes up to me and he said, hey, what, what's the oxygen for? I said, oh, I'm dying. I said, I'm um, trying to bring awareness to pulmonary fibrosis. And he, and he started tearing up and he started you know, crying. And he said, oh, well, I'm gonna pray for you on, the, on my way back to Washington. And then he turned around and he said, this is like a God moment. He turned around and said, can I do anything else for you? And I said, oh yeah, it's on my bucket list to meet President Trump. <laughs> funny thing was 10 days later i'm standing in the oval office meeting with president trump and vice president pence and i'm sharing about pulmonary fibrosis wow. and the interesting thing when god sets you up <laughs> the interesting thing was several days later president trump signs into law that uh terminally ill patients can try medication so I kind of think I had a little bit to do with that because he did it like days later after he met a terminally ill person who was taking medication to hopefully slow down the pro progression of uh, pulmonary fibrosis. Amazing. So that's like one of the things I did before transplant. Yeah. And I, just, I want to share this other thing. Yeah. Okay. I was an actor in New York in musical theater, but when I be became a Christian at age 19, now listen, I was trained in acting and dance. At NYU, I, you know, I loved the theater. I loved musicals. I loved, that was, that's the only thing I was actually trained in and was, you know, my wife said was good at, you know, and, and I felt like the Lord said, would you give that up for me? And that was painful. It was like, I didn't know what else to do. Yeah. I didn't know what other job I'm, you know, what, what was I going to do? Yeah. But out of obedience, I said, yeah, I'll do that. And I went into the ministry. And, uh, you know, God sees everything that we go through and everything that maybe we sacrifice in life. And he always turns everything around for good. He, he always rewards us, uh, you know, and he's so, he's so great the way he does it. So here's what happened. So I get sick, I get terminally ill, and the local news media calls me and says, hey, can we follow you around for a year and do a documentary about you with pulmonary fibrosis? I said, sure. So this guy followed me, Gilbert Corsi. He, he followed me around for a year and we did, you know, sh shots here and there in the city uh, uh, of shoot, shooting the, the documentary. And uh, it's over. He's getting it ready to air on TV. And uh, he calls me up and he said, hey, listen, Mike, uh, I'm up for an Emmy Award. 
would you and Patty want to come to the Emmy Awards uh, for the local news media? And, uh, you know, I can't promise you we're going to win, but, you know, I want you to be there. I said, okay. So we got all, you know, dressed up and we went out to the Emmy Awards and we sat there and he was up for Emmys for the Muhammad Ali story when Muhammad Ali passed away and mm -hmm. all the, you know, great stories. And then me, uh, I'm dying. Will you help Mike Olson story? So he didn't win the, un win the awards for the Muhammad Ali story, but the last one he was up for was the Mike Olson project, uh, the Mike Olson story, um, I'm dying. Will you help? And lo and behold, he wins the Emmy. <laughs> So he calls me up on stage to talk to the Emmy crowd. And then he hands me the Emmy and he says, Mike, this is your Emmy. It's engraved. I'm dying. Will you help? That's you. And he hands me the Emmy. I'm going to show you this Emmy. because This is like crazy. Yes. <laughs> so here I am in my house with an Emmy award. <laughs> I mean, awesome. I mean, who does this? Look at Sky's all excited. Are you excited about that Emmy award? Huh? I mean, who gets an Emmy for dying? So I, so I tell everybody, it took dying to get noticed around here. <laughs> but the funny part was when I went up and received that Emmy, you know, the, Gilbert shared the Emmy with me. I, I looked up to heaven and I said, God, you have a sense of humor. You know, it took 35, I think 35, 40 years later, I'm walking the red carpet and getting this Emmy award. That's God. That's that's kind of things God does. Okay, that was all preface to see, to bring you up to the point where, okay, now I'm waiting five years on a transplant list. And it was grueling because, you know, it was like waking up every day thinking, is this going to be my last day? Is this going to be my last breath? I mean, it was like nerve wracking. Yeah. I got a call six months after I was listed in, in 2015. I think I was starting getting listed. Um, anyway, and it was a dry run, which means the organs were no good. There was a mass on the donor's uh, organ. And so they couldn't be used. So they sent me home. And then I waited four more years, a total of almost five. Uh, anyway, and finally got the call. But uh, let me tell you another story before I got the call and before I got a heavenly experience. So it was six months before uh, I got the call and Patty and I, uh, you know, we were ministering to these patients who are dying of pulmonary fibrosis. So one of them called me, Mary, and she said, hey, I'm going to be in, in a town next to you at a state park. Hey, you, you want to come meet me? Um, you know, we could actually meet face to face instead of being, you know, on, on, on the uh, Internet. So I said, sure. So. Uh, I told Patty, hey, you know, I was always dragging her around. Hey, we're going to go see the president. Hey, we're going to go <laughs> see Dennis Quaid. Hey, we're going to. So she's like, what are we doing now, Mike? And I said, <laughs> I know you don't feel well. I know you're home from work. But I have this opportunity to meet a patient who's dying as well, is on oxygen. And I thought, let's do it. She goes, listen, I'm home sick from work. I really don't feel well. If you drive, I'll go. Uh, and she goes, but I got to chill in the car. So I said, fine. So right before we were getting ready to leave, uh, a couple in the church and another young lady from uh, the church came over and they were going to clean the house because it, Patty was overwhelmed and she was working full time. The only one working, only one bringing in an income, providing my health insurance. So they came over and um, the my man and wife, uh, Amy and John, Jonathan, um, they said, can we pray for you guys before you leave town? And we're like, oh, sure. So the night before Patty was praying and God sees the specifics of our prayer, what we pray, it, no words go unnoticed. So Patty was praying, uh, oh God, I, I know Mike is so, you know, horrifically ill. And it, it's, uh, it's, it, it's an anguish, you know, it was just, it's just horrible because we're believers, you know, we believe in healing, we believe God can do anything, but here, here it is, Mike's dying and uh, we, everyone's praying, but he's not getting healed. So anyway, 
they start praying and well patty started praying i'm sorry the night before and she was saying but just because you can god you could heal mike or just because you can you can make a way where there seems to be no way just because you can for sure god so anyway this girl comes the next day uh with this couple and the girl starts praying for patty and she's just this is exactly what she said she goes patty i want to pray for you she, she goes let's pray she said lord just because you can just because you can you can touch mike and patty right now she repeated patty's secret prayer in her prayer closet out, out loud the next day wow. so god god was listening so wow. then so then the couple uh said that jonathan started prophesying and he said mike i just believe you're going to start seeing visions and and God's going to start moving in your life, even though you're sick, even though, you know, things are, you know, looking bad. Um, God's going to start using you regardless. So I said, okay, I appreciate that. <laughs> Excuse me. So then they left, uh, we left and um, we met Mary and we had a good time. And on the way home, um, we're driving back home and I get lightheaded and my oxygen ran out. So Patty goes, what is wrong with you? Why are you driving like this? And I said, I don't know. So I, we pulled over and lo and behold, I had to change my e-tank out. And so I was much better on the rest of the trip home. But we got to this section of the highway and uh, it was like 1123 at night. And we're driving down this highway. We're the only ones on the highway. And all of a sudden, I look in front of the car and this deer appears. I mean, like, it was weird because the deer appeared, stood there 12 inches from my bumper and just was there. And by the time I saw it and Patty saw it, we screamed, Jesus. And I slammed on my brake and I hear him thinking, forget the lung transplant. I'm going to be killed with this deer coming through my windshield. Oh, but, uh, <laughs> So then after we yelled out Jesus, all of a sudden, it was like the deer was illuminated. We could see this gigantic deer. And all of a sudden, it's like we drove through it, you know, because I just, because I, I was like, what happened here? I, I said, Patty, did you see that? Because I want to make sure I wasn't crazy. Yeah. And so Patty, Patty goes, no, it was a deer. And where did it go? So we look behind in the rear view mirror and then we look in front of the highway and we're like, and there was literally walls on either side of the highway were like 15 feet high. So he couldn't get any, go away anywhere. And I, I said, did it hit the bumper? And she said, no. So I said, to, what happened? And so we looked at each other and then kind of shaken up. And we thought, I think we just drove through a deer or God made it disappear or dematerialize like Star Trek right in front of us. <laughs> so I said, well, as long as you saw it, Patty, then I saw it too then. So I am just making sure. So then we started thinking, is there a sign? The Lord's trying to tell us something here. Yeah. So, so, you know, as a pastor, I'm reviewing all the deer scriptures and I'm going as a deer pants for the water. So my soul pants after you. Well, we weren't really seeking the Lord right then, so it didn't make sense. So that just, that just does not fit. So we went home, called my son, because he was an Irish dancer, and his nickname was Leaping Deer. And uh, so I said, hey, Chauncey, you know, did you hear from God, you know, or see a vision? Because, Dad, I don't see visions. So I said, okay. So uh, I ruled that out. So then... Patty goes to work the next day. We're still thinking about it, talking about it. And it's like the Lord reminded me, hey, Mike, you know, you studied the tribes of Israel when you were in Bible college. Do you remember? I'm like, yeah. And then I just start to remember, oh, yeah, they were encamped about Israel. They all had banners or ensigns that had symbols on it to set the tribe of Judah, you know, tribe of, the, you know, all these different tribes. But one of them had a deer symbol. And that caught my eye, so I looked it up, and it said the deer symbol was from the tribe of Naphtali. And the story behind that 
tribe and simple was that um, there's two women in the Bible. One, one could have a child, one could not, Rachel and Leah. And he saw the handmaiden uh, and she was like crying out. And, and the Lord said to her, I've seen your struggle. Mm-hmm. See, the Lord sees when we're going through something. Yeah. And so that was the interpretation of the deer that we saw. God was saying to Patty and Mike, I have seen your struggle. I understand that you're looking to get freed from this breathlessness and that you need a new pair of lungs. I know that. And in fact, the Lord had spoke to me in my private prayer. I said, God, what's going to happen? Am I going to get a supernatural miracle? What's going to happen here? And, you know, he just keeps telling me to trust him, right? So I felt like he said in my prayer closet, Mike, you're going to get a lung transplant. Like, why? What what would be purpose of that? How could I bring you glory in that? But, you know, God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts and our thoughts. And, you know, a lot lot of Christians were praying for me, which I loved, but they were saying, you know, kind of name it and claim it just no you you it's going to come this way it's going to be in this form and you know i and it's great to believe like that i i i believe you can trust god for supernatural things but god already told me that it was going to be a, a double lung transplant and that's the road i was to take and see you know we the lord says take up your cross and follow me a lot of times christians don't want to talk about crosses yeah. nor do they want to talk about suffering and i always point them to hebrews 11 you know the faith chapter everyone loves to quote all the first part of hebrews 11 but they don't kind of finish the chapter where it's talked about suffering where it talked about uh, how these uh men and and of god suffered and and how they died Mm -hmm. and some some looked upon the promises but yet not received right yeah. So it doesn't always work out like we planned or what we desire. It's what God wants, what God ordains, and what God says. So that dear story kind of helped us for six months to trust the Lord, to know He sent a deer. <laughs> we call it our dear story to encourage us that He's seen our struggle, yeah. that it's going to happen. The promise is going to be fulfilled. I am going to get healed in one way or another so um so then it comes up to the the point of just before getting the call for transplant and patty has my wife has a dream and in the dream i'm getting a transplant a double lung transplant so she wakes up the next morning she says man i never dream hardly ever dream you're the dreamer you get you have dreams you have visions and she said but Wow, it was so real, Mike. And I and at that point, you know, not that I didn't believe her or or believe people's prayers. I it was just I was getting tired mentally, physically, emotionally for everything I was going through. And I just like, well, Patty, if, if it comes to pass, it comes to pass. So then she said, Oh, by the way, I have this lady I knew through the drive-thru at the bank. She says she'd like to come pray for you. And with her friend Cindy, and I'm told my wife, I, I don't want another person praying for me. <laughs> Not that I didn't, you know, appreciate it. It's just that I didn't want to jump through hoops. I didn't want to, you know, kind of, you know, I don't know. Mm-hmm. After a while, when you're terminally ill, when you're sick, and people want it so bad for you, and you know, you know, I just I'm not the type of person where someone says okay i prayed do something you couldn't do before like what breathe <laughs> you know so you know and i didn't want to disappoint him when when they say take off your oxygen and go yeah i kind of need that yeah. so uh, so anyway i said i really the funny part was you got to know my wife so i said yeah i don't think uh, i want another people i don't know come pray for me and she goes well then just go ahead and die <laughs> oh my <laughs> So she was kind of half kidding, but she she was like, this could be your answer is basically what she was saying. Yeah. So I said, okay, okay. You can come over to pray. 
<laughs> so they came over, but they wound up praying for Patty more than for me that night. And we worshiped and uh, they said, can we come over again next weekend? So I said, sure. <laughs> so they came over the following weekend and Cindy gets through the door of her living room and she goes, I know you don't know me that well. She goes, yeah, you probably think I'm kooky, but I'm going to just tell you what I saw on the way here. I saw a set of lungs coming down from heaven being put into your chest. Mm -hmm. I said, wow. Okay. And Patty's like, I had that dream. And then Cindy had this vision. So the next day, um, I think it was Sunday, I was working on some folk art in my cabin in the backyard because I was doing some folk art to raise awareness for pulmonary fibrosis. So I was getting into it, had my oxygen tank, uh, tube <laughs> and tanks, and working out there. And all of a sudden, I hear the Lord's voice. And you know what? God wants to speak to us, whether we're washing dishes, whether we're, you know, at the grocery store, like, talk to this person at the register, mm -hmm. you know, like, listen to him. So I'm working with this artwork, and he says, put all that up, Mike. The Lord says, put, put all that up right now. I'm like, wow. I mean, like, you know, God's talking to me in my everyday life doing, you know, things I love. And so I'm like, oh, I better, I, I, I know the voice of the Lord. I know he said to put this up. So I just start packing it all away. And I felt like he was like, you pack this away for a while because you're not going to get back to it. So I was wow. like, wow, that's so strange. But uh, I said, okay. So I'm walking back to the house and I get to the back porch and my wife goes, uh, guess what? the hospital's on the phone i'm like why you know because the transplant center calls me every once in a while for different things you know check on my uh progress and my pulmonary rehab and all that so she said no no it's dr fox it's your lung surgeon they they have a pair of lungs for you and i just i just couldn't believe it I just couldn't believe it. It was such a long wait. And I thought I was just going to die from this disease. And yet I heard the Lord say I was going to get the transplant. You know, just because the Lord says something or, or speaks into your life, you know, sometimes we doubt and sometimes we waver. And I was like ecstatic. And I couldn't believe that I was going to finally be, be able to breathe again, not carry the oxygen around. I was carrying the oxygen around for so long on a, on a little you know, holder with wheels that I really wrenched my shoulder, my right shoulder, because I was kept on, I would lug that thing everywhere. I, I lugged it to the pool. We had a, a, a membership at this uh, spa place that we did my pulmonary exercise. And I would have 50 foot of oxygen uh, tubing that I could actually go into the pool with my oxygen. And anyway, so, I was waiting such a long time for this to happen. So the doctor gets on the phone and says, Mike, are you ready? Uh, because uh, these lungs are a perfect match for you. And I said, are you sure? He goes, no, no. Yeah, they're, they match. They're, they're good. You need to get in here. So I was like, wow, okay. So I, you know, you know, it felt like we were like, I love Lucy where, where she got, she was pregnant and she was trying to rush to get to the hospital yeah that's kind of like what it was because we're, i'm like what do we do oh we have all these dogs who's gonna watch the dogs you know and like oh my goodness i i don't i don't know if i have my to-go bag ready and uh so luckily we only live 15 minutes uh to the transplant center downtown louisville yeah. and here's an interesting thing i want to say this i before i got sick I was working for this company and we kind of felt like, ah, oh, maybe we can move. Maybe we can move out of state and go somewhere else and try something different because we were, you know, curious to see. We always wanted to move to Florida. And I felt like the Lord said, no, you need to stay in Kentucky. And because I did and because I obeyed that voice again, I was able to have uh, short term disability through my company. And I was able to get the transplant surgery along with my wife's insurance. So I was so glad we stayed because the transplant center was only 15 minutes away. I mean, it's, it's a lot of people go 
hours in, in different states to get a transplant. And I was blessed to have one right here in, in town. So I go to the hospital, get there and do a little go live video on Facebook because I had thousands of people have been rooting for me for years. And uh, so I get there and I'm getting wheeled down the hallway and this, no kidding, this patient comes up bounding out of the one of the rooms and said, Mike, I can't believe you got the call for your lungs. Cause she's, she had watched it on my Facebook live. She herself was a pulmonary patient and I was ministering to her as well as others. And she said, I just wanted to give you a hug before you go up for the operation. I'm in the hospital myself, but I couldn't resist. So Aww. I thought that was really interesting. Yes. So um, get down the hall, they, they prep me, they put a, a port in my neck and they, you know, get me all prepped for surgery, shave my chest because it's a lung transplant. And uh, I'm like taking it all in going, this is just wild. I can't believe it's actually happening. So get um, to the OR. And of course they give you that lovely fentanyl and propofol and all that wonderful medication that you need to make sure you're not uh, going to uh, awaken from this process. Yes. And uh, so they did. And, uh, you know, it's a 12 hour surgery. And so uh, they told me already they were going to do tag team because to my one surgeon who I really wanted to be uh, doing the surgery, he was in another OR doing a transplant surgery. So, and so then I, I did get him toward the end, but <laughs> so um, they start the surgery, things are going fairly well. They look at the lungs and they're really, really good, um, pink and just wonderful <laughs> lungs. And, uh, you know, it, it was just amazing to them that they, they were viable and, and that Mike was gonna get these new lungs. So they go into the surgery and uh, at this time, they had tall, tall Patty, you just go home and rest because it's going to be a long haul. We'll call you if you need, you know, we need you for anything. Yeah. Uh, so she goes home. Well, she goes to the bank. She has some things to do at the bank. And then she goes home and takes a little siesta and they get the first lung in. And at that exact time, an oxygen tank that was on my front porch falls over, which in all the years I've had them on the front porch, they've never done this. I mean, these things are heavy. Yeah. Falls over, boing, wakes Patty up. And she thinks, Mike, Mike's in surgery. Let me call. So she calls the hospital and they said, first lung in. <laughs> it was like the Lord was showing Patty, you know, waking her up saying, you know, he's halfway there. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, so God can use oxygen tanks falling over and get our attention. Yeah. So um, they go ahead and continue the surgery and second lung was in. And then um, what happened was they were closing me up and they were taking the clamp off, the last clamp off one of the arteries and it bled out. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I read the doctor's notes uh, recently because I'm writing a book. It, the doctor's notes said that torrents of blood and they just couldn't stop the bleeding. And it was like over four and a half liters of blood, almost all my blood in my body. Yeah. And uh, so they were suturing and uh, catheterization and all the stuff they were doing to bring me back. And, and actually they told me it was violently, they were trying to bring me back and uh, resuscitating me. And uh, they put me on a heart and lung machine and um, in fact, I have what Patty calls my Amazon smile scar on the back of my head. We, for the, to this day, we don't know how that happened, but we believed it was the violent way they were tossing me around or whatever on the gurney. Oh. So, uh, so anyway, um, I bled out profusely and they were trying to bring me back. But during that time, I had died and... I can see my I can see myself on the operating table, and all of a sudden, I was kind of lifting off the table, which I thought this isn't supposed to happen, you know, like this is really strange. So, the funny part was so well, 
I'll tell you first thing that happened. When I'm lifting off the table, I hear these voices. And it wasn't the doctors and it wasn't the nurses. It was uh, voices of negativity. And they were saying, who do you think you are? You know, they're just like berating me. You know, I didn't even know what all that they were saying, just bits and pieces of you're a sinner, you're terrible, you're this, you're that. And, you know, I just thought, wait a second, you know, first of all, you, you can't talk to me like that because I'm a child of God. And I said, shut up in Jesus name. Yes. I said, sure and simple. So anyway, those voices stopped and never spoke again. And, she, you know, it's kind of a principle for our life as Christians is that don't give time a day for negativity, voices, tauntings from the enemy. Don't even give it and don't even talk about it. Yes. Because uh, it, it, does, it doesn't bring anything or add anything to your life but confusion and doubt and fear. Yes. So, you know, just cut it off. And, you know, a lot of people want to talk about those kind of woo experiences and weird things. You know, I don't, I don't give any time to that. Yeah. I always tell everybody, if you want to talk about anything, talk about Jesus, talk about his glory, talk about the angels, because whatever you talk about, that's what's going to manifest. Mm -hmm. that, that's what's going to fill your life and your mind and your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Saying that, after that experience, lifting off the table and hearing those voices, and then all of a sudden I'm, I'm above the table. I guess I feel like it's like in the ceiling area, mm -hmm. right? And keep rising up. And I said to myself, because I'm such a jokester, I said, "Well, at least I'm going up. That's good." <laughs> so, so I don't know why I said that, but I did to myself, and it made me chuckle. So then. All of a sudden, I'm looking around, and I see these swirling lights all around me, like in a big uh, circle. And they were like brilliant rainbow color lights, but they were just technicolor. They were just like really awesome. And then I started thinking in my finite, in my mind, I thought, "Is this all the drugs? Is this all the, you know, the?" Uh, anesthesia or, or what's you know i because i wanted to make sure what i was experiencing was you know not drug induced yeah and and i'm like no because all of a sudden when i stop those kind of thoughts all of a sudden i hear singing and i and it, they're singing they ain't they're angels that's what i perceived and i saw that there were angels myriads of angels that's why they were swirling around and Anyway, they start singing, Mike's coming home. Mike's coming home. And then I knew, you know, how I'm, I'm in, in the presence of angels and I'm being brought up to glory. And then the Lord said, no, he's just here for a visit. And then I kept on floating higher, you know, through the atmosphere into heaven. And I'm standing there in heaven. And the only way I can experience or tell you the experience is that I was bathed in heaven's light. It was light. I call it hot light, bright light. As far as the eye can see, it was the glory of the Lord filling the heavenlies. And when I looked, it was like, the only way I can explain it, it was like the atmosphere was infused with like molecules, but they all were like crying out, Jesus, I mean, like Jesus, that very presence, the essence, the beauty, the fragrance of Jesus permeated that whole atmosphere. And then I'm standing there and I could see myself, I could see my body and it was all white, you know, like, like bathed in light, you know? And then I started thinking, cause I'm standing there, I, I, I don't see anything, you know, people, you know, vegetation, nothing like that. But I, I start having thoughts, and in my thoughts, I thought, I don't feel guilty anymore. I don't feel like my sin is weighing me down. Because you know what? Just because we become Christians doesn't mean we still don't deal with battle with sin, yeah. And 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 shortcomings and mistakes, and you know all the things that you know could have, should have, would have in life. Uh, so I'm I'm standing there, and I thought in my conscious self, 
I couldn't remember my past. I, I couldn't remember any sin. And when I thought that, it was like a blackboard, you know, and you just erased everything and it's all gone. And that's how I felt. And I felt so, you know, encouraged and blessed. And I just felt like, wow, it's all Jesus. It's every, anything that we accomplished on the earth, it's all him. That's what I felt like when I was in heaven. It's all him. You know, all the striving, all, all the worrying and, and the, you know, even as a Christian, you know, have I done enough? I was, you know, you know, we tend to compare ourselves. We're, we're not Billy Graham. We haven't won millions to the Lord. You know, we haven't, you know, our little bit that we do, is it enough? Is it enough, God? Am I pleasing you? Are you, do you, you know, uh, you happy with me? You know, when you're in heaven, those thoughts, none of that matters. In fact, I just had this epiphany. Oh my goodness. I wasted so much time on the earth worrying about finances, worrying about my my family, my spouse, my, you know, how I appear to others. And it was just like a weight was lifted. Like none of that matters. <laughs> none of that matters. And even the suffering, although I didn't like it, even though it was hard to wait on a transplant, even that doesn't matter in the light of eternity. The things that we go through might seem like they're long and gruesome and horrible down here, but in the light of eternity, it's all woven into the fabric of who we will be. You know what I mean? Like, so I, I love that story about the tapestry where one side of the tapestry is a beautiful picture, but the other side is all these strings and, and, and you know, we always tend to see the mess, yeah. but God sees the finished, finished work. And so that's what it was like in heaven. It was like, I, I know I had a, uh, an opportunity to stay if I wanted to, because that thought came to me, but I thought of my wife and my son, and I thought there was something more I should do when I go back. So I, cho I chose to come back. But the instant I was standing there with that thought on my mind, all of a sudden, I, I just cried out. I want to thank my donor because my heart was so grateful that I got a pair of lungs that I was going to be able to live, you know, as many years as the Lord was going to give me. And I wanted to thank that person who signed their organ donor card, who made the sacrifice and who, you know, did that for me. You know, I'm grateful, I'm humble. And all of a sudden, when I had that thought and when I cried out, and I always say when I cried out, it's so interesting in heaven because when I cried out, it was my spirit was crying out. It wasn't words coming out of my mouth. Yeah. And and that's kind of the communication I had with Jesus and the donor too. Yeah. It, it was like, I hate to say telepathic, but it was just like, we just knew. Yeah. Words were spoken and we just knew. Yeah. So anyway, I, I, at that moment, I looked behind my left shoulder because I, something caught my eye and, and I, I looked and I was like, it was Jesus. And I saw the person next to him and it was my donor. And I, I was like, it was like an instant answer prayer and I looked. And I was trying to study the donor. And you know, it was so interesting that I saw Jesus knew my spirit, my spiritual spirit, that was Jesus. But I couldn't see a clear image of him, nor the donor, which kind of bummed me out because I, you know, I'm the type of person where I'm very on earth, I'm boisterous, I'm full of life, making every breath count. And and yet I'm like, oh Lord, why why couldn't I see everything clearly? But for me, that's how it happened. And I was okay with it. And there's but a reason. At, yeah. There was a reason for it. And probably because, you know, I might brag a little bit. I don't know. <laughs> so <laughs> so I look in at Jesus and the donor. And I look at the donor and they have their head down. I'm like, why do they have their head down? Are they embarrassed to be there? Are they, you know, why, why? He was just so humbled. Or she, I, I, they were just so humbled 
that they were in the presence of Jesus and they were called upon. And I was like, because I don't think they wanted it to be about them. But because I cried out and asked for that honor to see my donor, Jesus brought forth the donor right there. And then next thing I know, Jesus put his hand on my left shoulder. And he said, Mike, these are your new lungs. Receive them. I said, wow, yes, Lord. I receive these new lungs. And as soon as I made that agreement with heaven, with Jesus, it was like he was waiting for me to acknowledge it, express it, and receive it. Because then I floated right back down into the OR. And I think it was important, the Lord was trying to show me, Mike, these are your lungs. From heaven, through this donor, into your chest, so you can live again. And to me, as a transplant, transplant person, you don't know how important that is. Because I don't care how strong you are mentally, emotionally, but to know that you have another person's organs in your body and you're breathing with those lungs that were somebody else's or our heart, you know, or liver or kidney. But to know that I was breathing with another person's lungs, I needed that reassurance from heaven. It is, it's okay, Mike. And it's not that I, I feared having someone else's lungs in my body. But I think because I'm a Christian and I'm also super sensitive spiritually, um, I really needed to know that, that it was okay to receive these new lungs. And, you know, I, I read probably too many stories about transplants and about supernatural phenomena that occurred when people got organs from other people's bodies. And so I wanted to make sure, and God loves to comfort us, and he made sure they're okay, Mike, I allow them to be put in your body. And here's another thing I thought about after that experience was, you know, we're body, soul, and spirit. Now, my body was in the OR laying on that table, but my spirit and soul were going up to heaven, yet I had a bodily form in heaven. Yeah. and. I, I just, this is how I like to think about it, whether it's theologically true or not. I feel like I breathed my first breath with the new lungs when I was in heaven. Okay. And I also feel that when I was touched by Jesus on my shoulder, that I carry an anointing of heaven and I take heaven with me everywhere I go now and I, I can see that touching people's lives after this experience happened that I do carry heaven with me and uh because I was touched there and I, I and I and this is really a big responsibility to have that that touch of heaven on my, on my life and I I take it very seriously so anyway I came back and uh and here's what it was interesting about that encounter, my heavenly encounter. I came back and I was in a coma for 10 days. You know, they're trying to, I wasn't breathing on my own. Yeah. I didn't even know where, I, I didn't even know where I was. Seriously, for the first four or five days. And I still think I experienced more things, but I, it has been brought back to my remembrance. But anyway, during that time though, my wife was home in our living room with her sister Kay. And we went through a, a lot of uh, trouble with our home because the transplant center said, that home has to be dust free, no ceiling fans, no, no air movement through purifiers, uh, you know, no nothing that could affect this, uh, his new lungs. So they discovered there was mold in our bathroom and in our basement. So there was no way I could come home. So they had to do renovations, got the bathroom 
and just fix all the all the issues that were going on. In fact, one of the issues was the gutters of the house were uh, falling off and there was causing water to seep down to the basement. So here's another God thing. So this, this uh, woman, Melanie, whose mother had pulmonary fibrosis, caught wind that we were in trouble. And they lived over in, in North Carolina. And she texted Patty and said, we're there. My husband does gutter repair. And so we're going to put brand new gutters all around your house so Mike can get home. <laughs> so God takes care and his ears are open to our needs. So anyway, Patty's home doing all this uh, uh, renovation. And she's sitting there with her sister Kay. And all of a sudden she said, Kay, I don't know how I know this, but Mike got to go to heaven and meet his donor. And my sister-in-law said to her sister, Patty, Kay said, okay, well, we'll, we'll know when Mike's got out of the coma, if that's true or not. So I'm in the coma. <laughs> Patty has this intuition and knowing that I had been to heaven. <laughs> so then she um, comes to the day, a long wait. I was intubated on a ventilator uh, for 10 days. And then finally, um, they said, oh, I think it's time we can finally, they attempted several times before, but they said, I think we finally can take the tube out of his throat. And so they did, uh, well, they were just about to, and Patty wanted to be there for that because uh, before that I could, I could barely write on a, a, a white outboard and I, it was like chicken scratch. Patty could hardly read it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, so she wanted to be there when the tube got taken out. So she tells the story to my friend Jeff that I just know Mike went to heaven and got to uh, thank his donor. And Jeff's like a doubting Thomas. He goes, yeah, sure, Patty. I want to be there in the ICU when they take the tube out. And I'll ask him myself. So Patty goes, all right, come on along to the hospital with me. So. They take the tube out, breathing on my own for the first time. And in walks Jeff and my wife, Patty. And Jeff says, hey, hey, Mike. I'm like, yes, because I'm just coming out of getting extubated. Yeah. And uh, my, my voice was three octaves lower. Mm. I felt like one of those guys that, uh, on the radio. Hey, baby, how you doing? <laughs> and it was like really low. And Jeff walks in and says, Mike, when you were out in the Netherlands, you know, he's Scandinavian, so he uses that terminology. Uh, he said, did you experience anything? And he, he's just waiting for my reply. And I said, yeah, yeah. I said, I went to heaven and I got to uh, thank my donor. Oh. And, his, and his eyes got so big and he looks to Patty and Patty goes, I told you, I told you. And so they're both dancing around with joy in the ICU room. And I'm trying to figure out why they're so happy. And then Patty told me the story that God had told her beforehand that that exactly what happened. And so it was confirmation for her and for me uh, because it was it was encouraging to me that God would tell her what happened to me in heaven. So, uh, and, fa and fun, funny, our wives know us so well and been married 34 years. So um, anyway, she uh, said to me, Mike, you know, seriously, if God hadn't told me before you told me, she goes, I don't, I don't have a little, maybe a little hard time believing you, but God told me. And then you confirmed it by telling us she went to heaven and uh, got to meet your donor. So uh, nice. it was just incredible, uh, incredible um, uh, experience. That, and the Lord really kind of ministered to us through that experience. And uh, it, I still think about it and I, I get emotional every time I talk about it because it's like I relive it. I actually can feel the presence uh, of angels and, and uh, when I retell a story every time. Wow. So I get, 
So after this happened, I'm trying to process it all. I and it took me over a month to get home. And so I was living in my friend's B and B, Airbnb. And uh so finally to be able to get home and I get settled into my bedroom and Patty has to go back to work because she had taken off four or five weeks and had to be back at work. And uh so I said, I'll be fine, you know, and I I was having a lot, I was kind of having complications because when I had died in the in 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 the surgery, uh what happened was when they took the clamp off too early and, and I bled out, all that blood that was transfused went down into my um bronchial tubes and scarred my bronchial tubes. Oh my gosh. And caused caused what's called pulmonary fibrosis. Mm -hmm. So from the get go, I was having multiple uh, surgeries. I had a collapsed lung. I had um, oh, so many issues going on. I so anyway, and then I had another surgery uh, called a Nissan fundoplication, where they attach your esophagus to your stomach. Uh, so I wind up losing seventy pounds. So going through a lot. So anyway, I get home, grateful I'm finally in my own home. And uh, have my two dogs, and they were elderly dogs. They're like 14, 15 years old, and they they held on till I got home. And then, uh, so anyway, I'm in my bedroom one day, and you know, just enjoying being home. Dogs on my lap, you know, and all of a sudden, I I'm just startled because in my bedroom, an angel appears from the top of the ceiling to the floor. And it was just staring at me. And I was like, whoa, what are you doing here? You know, like, yeah. I didn't know what to, he, was, he was just staring and, and then disappeared. And so I said, God, what was that? And what was it for? And he said, oh, Mike, they're still watching you. And I'm like, why did they amaze them or something? Like, <laughs> was my life so, so exciting that the angels are watching me? And they said, and he said, no, they just, trying to assure you that they're still here they're still watching over you because i was still struggling even after transplant with all these issues so um so anyway uh that kind of just showed me that you know the supernatural is it really should be an everyday occurrence with christians you know like we hear about angels appearing in the bible to mary to joseph in a dream mm -hmm. you know different things and then we hear about translation where Philip was going from one city to the other because the spirit took him and, you know, Star Trek him to the next place. You know, these kind of things, you know, we read these stories as cute little Bible stories. Hey, this is nice, <laughs> but it, they're true. Yeah. You know, when Jesus said to the disciple, you know, the taxes were due, go into the fish, go fishing and out of the fish's mouth, you'll find a gold coin. Come on. <laughs> you know, like, if God can do that, he could do anything, right? Yeah. I don't know why we worry about so many things, but God can do anything. My favorite verse in the Bible is God sits in heaven and does what he pleases, you know, because he just is and he just does. So uh, so anyway, they had that angel experience. And then I start thinking about my heavenly experience. I'm like, no, those angels were rainbow. I'm like, I wonder what that meant. So I looked it up in scripture and in Revelation, there's a, a scripture that says, and I saw an angel with a rainbow over its head. And I thought, oh, interesting. So there are rainbow angels. I mean, that's that's very interesting. Very. So, yeah, so uh, there you go. So uh, I know other groups are trying to steal the rainbow symbol, but trust me, it's God's symbol and it's a God of promise. And so we'll just reclaim that back. Mm -hmm. But uh, so anyway, um, so that's what happened after transplant. And uh, God's just been moving really ever since uh, changing my way of thinking. Like what happened that my trip to heaven helped me is just, just to let go and be chill. You know, like, like I thought, oh, I'm so worried that I'm not in a pulpit anymore. I'm not doing ministry like I normally would do. And I was doing it online with the patients, but now what do I do now that I got these new set of lungs and, and God keeps opening doors for me to do things. So 
uh, ministry may not always look uh, like normal everyday ministry or the things that were taught, you know, the fivefold ministry, either you're one of these types and walk in that, uh, which is true. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the ministry is God just working in our everyday life. Uh, and it's interesting because as I tell the story, uh, which God prompts me to tell the story every once in a while when I'm out in public. And my sister-in-law was dying in a hospital in Florida several months ago. And we were at this hotel. And uh, for some reason, I think my wife had called ahead and said, my husband is a transplant patient. The room needs to be really super clean and no smoke, you know, whatever. And so she always preps the hotel uh, management before I get anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so she had called ahead and she just said, I'm a double lung transplant patient. And so when we got to the hotel, the woman at the counter uh, said, oh yeah, I heard you're a double lung transplant patient. I said, oh yeah. I said, yeah, I, I died, went to heaven, got to meet my donor. And she said, what, can you, can you repeat that? So I said, yeah, I died, went to heaven, got to meet my donor. She goes, no, 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 no. You come up to the counter and tell me the whole story. So wow. I said, okay. So I went through everything I just told you, and uh, all of a sudden she started weeping. <laughs> and I'm like, wow. I'm like, what do I do with this? And she said, can I hug you? And I said, sure. We're sort of past COVID, but why not? Yes. So, <laughs> and I wear a mask anyway. I've been wearing a mask for seven years. So, uh, you know, because I'm Im Im immunosuppressed. But uh, so anyway, give her a hug. And she's weeping, and I said, uh, what's wrong? And I, she said, no, it's what's right. She said, you came here today and told me about heaven, and I was just recently doubting that there was even a heaven. And she goes, I'm a believer, but I'm just struggling and going through a lot right now, and God sends you to my counter to testify that there is a heaven, and, and God works in your life, even during dramatic, drastic, drastic situations. And I said, well, I'm glad I got to share that with you. And she goes, oh, you have did something in my heart. It settled something. And now I know I don't have to doubt anymore. And then that was it. That was the end of that little encounter there at the hotel. And so I believe whatever we experience, whatever we go through, we share with people. And, we, and we're just there for people. And so that's what I find myself doing more and more is just being there for people, sharing in their lives and uh, may not look like ministry, normal ministry, but you know, God wants us to, to go out into the highways and byways, compel them to come, they can gather in the end time harvest. And, and, and you know what? I think he just wants us to not strive so much and work so hard, but to, do the things it calls us to do in our everyday lives. Yes. Amen. And I, you know, you may not be technically in the pulpit, but I really believe you've gotten a big ministry promotion. And yeah. I know you just recently uh, had a podcast that's going on to Poland, you know, and yes. it's going around the world. And I really believe, um, I don't, I have to say this, but Devon Franklin, <laughs> if you're watching, I really, I do, I see a movie. This needs to be a movie because not just because of all the, the supernatural pieces are, are phenomenal. There's no denying that it's, it's such a beautiful, beautiful testimony But I think as far as I'm concerned, you, you show me, you, you remind me how I need to be living, you know, and, and you talk about making every breath count. It's not about Again, it's not about deeds. It's not like, well, how many episodes can I report, record? And, and these are wonderful. But like, like you said, it's in the moments, just having gratitude and trusting the yep. Lord and, and being present with whoever you're with at that moment. And each right. person he sent you to, there's going to be a ripple effect of that. So yeah, um, I, just, I, I know God is doing great things through you. And I'm just so happy to just have one little piece of you today um, that <laughs> I can share. But, um, and I know you mentioned that God is calling you to write. Um, can you, yeah. I know it's not finished yet and I'm being called to write too. I know it's a, it's a big thing, but can you share what he's putting on your heart or what do you feel like God has? Sure. Next? Yeah. I, at first I was going to write a book about my whole 
um, terminal lung disease. Um, I was going to call Catching My Breath in the Bluegrass, and eventually that book will be written. But I really felt the Lord wanted me to write about my heavenly encounter. So I'm going to be, it's going to be called Bathed in Heaven's Light. And um, it, it, it's just really a lot of things that I've been sharing with you today uh, will be in the book, but also like kind of some details uh, uh, of the things the Lord has showed me and, and uh, what thing, like here, here, one of the things is about heaven, our heavenly worship. And a lot of people don't realize, and I, I think it's because we've been taught uh, theology in a certain way, but like the, the verse that says, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. A lot of people like to interpret that as, oh, yes, positionally, positionally, we're there uh, with Christ, you know, in kind of in a way that we're like, in our mind, we're just like, yeah, that's, that, that, that's, that's a nice thought. But re in reality, we live in two different realms simultaneously. We live in the earthly realm and we live in the heavenly realm. And we are afforded <laughs> so many things when we live that way, when we appropriate that which has been given to us from the Lord, from heaven, the things that are in heaven. I love this one story I always heard that there was a storehouse in heaven and whatever we needed was in that storehouse. And whether it be a set of lungs, right? They were on that shelf getting ready to be taken down and put into Mike Olson. But we had to appropriate, believe for it, and trust the Lord, even if it meant an, an, uh, an organ transplant, you know? And so we live with that knowledge of the Lord uh, having all things uh, prepared for us. And that heaven, that when, when it says, I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places, we are there. We, we are with him not by any merit of ours or who we are, it's because of his blood and because of his forgiveness that God sees us holy in his sight because of his son. And so we, you know, those kind of things I'd like to share in the book is that, you know, wow, if we really think about that, you know, like Paul, Apostle Paul talked about going to the third heaven, you know, you know, it, there's, there's things that can happen through our prayer that we can actually access the heavenlies. I remember this one story, my wife and I and some friends were uh, praying and worshiping in a circle in Indiana one time, and we were all just getting caught up in the worship and we all were focused on the Lord. And then all of a sudden we all felt this, but we hadn't talked to each other yet because we were still worshiping. But when we compared notes after this was the case, we all felt like we were translated somewhere. And the sights, the smell, everything. And but we didn't want to say anything until we started talking to each other after the worship session. And we all were like, yes. I felt like we were in like some tribal uh, situation in Africa. And we all, we each separately had sensed that in our spirit. And that's because God can take us places. God can use us and, and, and minister to minister places. I remember this one story, one of my favorite stories by Joshua Mills was that he uh, was in a vision. Um, he was actually at a worship, uh, you know, during worship, during a, a church service, and he was taken out in the spirit. And in that vision, he went to uh, China and he was ministering to these people in this room. He went into an elevator. And uh, if you know anything about Joshua Mills, he, he, he got gold dust comes all over him when he preaches. And which is a whole nother thing. And other people are like, what? Gold dust? Yes. Gemstones? You know, yeah, I know. You, I've heard it all. And God can do anything he wants to do. Whether you believe it or not, God can do supernatural things that would probably blow our mind. But anyway, Joshua went into this elevator and got up to this room, ministered to these uh, Chinese men. He handed out his business card. 
right? Joshua yeah. Mills ministry to these men, right? Yeah. So then he comes to himself back into the minister into worship session in this church service, and he's back. He didn't say anything to anybody because he's like, wow, that was wild. Later on, in the earthly realm, he receives a call from one of the pastors in the vision. Oh my goodness. <laughs> because he had the credit, he had the uh, card. And so that's why, see, the Celtic Christians always spoke of a thin place, a place where we can reach into the heavenlies. And it's so close, you know, that we don't take advantage of that. But God can do some supernatural things if we just allow him to and uh and minister through us and with us um and that's the kind of things i want to write in the book so well that's i am wow wow that's that's exciting i i wow that's amazing i've heard people say you know when they've had these experiences that the veil is thin like it's so much it's so right there um yeah. so it's exciting um i want to tell you this one quick story too yes tell i could listen so, all day <laughs> So, so I was a pastor in this small Anglican church that we pastored. Um, one one night I was preaching, right? You know, in church, we, we have everything, all our ducks in a row. We do the worship. You know, we, we talked about the Catholics having their liturgy and, and the things they do, the same thing every Sunday. You know, Pentecostals, Charismatics, we, we all do the same thing. We have our time of worship. We have the sermon. We have the offering. So, it, you know, it's the same thing, different flavor. So anyway, I'm doing the preaching and I'm up in the pulpit and I had this boy in our congregation. Okay, so Corey had ADHD, right? Mm -hmm. And I knew it. He kind of run around the church during the sermon. And, he, you know, I, I try to explain to people in the congregation or people who are visiting, don't worry about Corey. He, you know, we're working on things, trying to get him to sit a lot more than, you know, going around the church. But you know what? It didn't really bother me because we had a lot of people with handicaps at our church coming in wheelchairs, cerebral palsy. And, you know, I, I really rather enjoyed uh, them to be in the service, being experiencing the move of the spirit than to put them in another room and have children's ministry. That's just me, because I feel like the kids should be there when the spirit moves because they can learn a lot by watching. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's a whole nother sermon. But uh, Corey was, I don't know what got into him this night, but he was throwing paper airplanes at the preacher while he was preaching. <laughs> so my little temperature gauge was kind of going up and going, I'm going to not like this. And I'm, I won't tell you what I wanted to do to Corey. So I said, Corey, stop that as nice as I could. And all of a sudden, I'm looking out at the congregation and I noticed something happened to Corey because his mother was looking at him like in astonishment when he sat down. So at the end of the service, she comes running up to me with Corey and she said, what is this? Corey was covered with gold all over his head. He had dark hair and all of his face was shining, glittering. And I looked in amazement and I said, God, what is this? Then he says, it's my glory. Well, you all were worrying about being so proper, doing your sermon, doing all your things that you do every Sunday. Glory was abandoned. I mean, it was, it was full of abandonment joy during worship, running around the church, their own paper airplanes. And I anointed him. Oh, man. And so... I looked and, and that it was gold dust from heaven <laughs> and in an unassuming child. And I repented because I said, Lord, he was doing what was necessary that night. I wasn't. He was touched. And I said, Corey, come here. Could you pray for us? And I took his little hand and had him pray for everyone in the congregation that night. And that gold dust disappeared. And he was anointed for the moment. God used a child. God used a child that was abandoned to him. And I'll always remember that story. 
and more than a story, that experience that we have with Corey. And uh, it just, that just showed me that God can do anything he wants to do, you yeah. know, and, and move the way he wants to. And we need to allow the spirit to move in our churches the way they, they want to, not by time constraints, not by what we deem is important. You know, sometimes I would say, I, I, literally, sometimes I'd forget to take the offering up because we were caught up in the spirit. So I had to say at the end of the service, oh, I forgot to take the offering. If you have anything, you know, put it in the basket on your way out, you know, because I was so caught up in the spirit. And then and, and other times the spirit would move and I just felt like to sh shut up. I didn't have to have a three point sermon. And I let the spirit move instead, and people were touched, and people would be weeping and healed and set free. So, you know, anyway, I don't know where I went with all that, but no, no, it's interesting. My friend, she just she watches, she follows some people in the prophetic ministry, and she told me the other day, she was Julie, there's gonna there's a time coming, right? Revival is coming. And she said, there's going to be a time when people, they can't even leave the church because the spirit of God will be so heavy and, and, and it's exciting, you know, and then it's wonderful to hear that with everything going on and, and, and going back to your testimony, I think that's why I feel like your message is so timely, you know, and I know just, it was just a few months ago that you felt the Lord impress upon you, you know, you need to share your testimony. And, you know, I get excited when I hear people say that but when they get ready to come on, because I know the Lord is in it. And um, I think the time that we're in right now, it's so important that we are reminded that the best is yet to come and heaven yeah. is real and that all the worries that we have here, I need that message from you today, you know, as a parent, yeah. as a um, you know, believer and with everything going on, it's just so important to be reminded. So yeah. I'm just so grateful. And one thing that I wanted to say too, you know, you've, you've been so gracious and you're so humble and I've seen your story shared so many places, but um, something that I felt like on my heart, you know, you've had 56 surgeries since your transplant, yes. you, know, you have your life you're not out riding mechanical bulls and, and skydiving and <laughs> mom says like you, you have these real issues that, you know, you're taking all this medication and yeah. have, I'm sure you have different therapies and you've had a lot of things that you haven't really touched on. You're, you know, you're sharing all the good stuff with us. Um, you know, and I saw on your Mike Olson project, Facebook page, this touched my heart to the point of tears. You know, I see all those surgeries and I know I can't imagine the financial burden that you have, um, yet you're posting this post, you're making these little prayer cloths for people, their little fabric lungs. And um, I'm thinking of all the debt that you have. Like, I just felt so touched that I wanted to bless you and I wanted to do something. And I found an old GoFundMe account. <laughs> um and my podcast is never about asking for money. So I'm not pressuring anyone. I'm not, I just know that God led me to, I just wanted to do something. And I asked your wife privately if that fund was still open and she said it is. So I'm just throwing this out there. I'm going to post that in the comments for anyone that feels led um, just to help you because you're not able to work and you're going through all these things. If you feel led to give a dollar or $5, whatever, um, I'm going to put a link because that, that account is still active. Um, so I hope you're okay with me sharing that. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. Yes. And yeah, because, I, do... I mean, I, I always tell people, you know, you, a lot of people think that when a transplant patient uh, gets their new organ, that they're just, life is wonderful after that. But unfortunately, it, it, what they say is we're trading one disease for another because, you know, after transplant, I, I have high blood pressure. I have, uh, I had diabetes, but I, was able to get out over that hump. You had uh, you got COVID too, which is and I had COVID in January this past January. So yeah, so it it, it is in and out of the hospital even after transplant. And so yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, and um, I just want to mention too, as a nurse, I feel it. It's you know this is my third interview that I can think of that there was an organ um, heart. Uh, I'm sorry, an organ recipient, uh, life changing a big decision, you know, and as a nurse anesthetist, I was able to see those families making those decisions. And it's truly heroic, you know, in the middle of tragedy and loss to make yeah. a decision to be a donor is huge. You know, I've always been an organ donor and, you know, I, I just looked up the statistics, 17 people die every day because they're yeah. an organ and it's a miracle yeah. that you got it is a miracle. 
and I just impress upon people, please, please, you know, it's, it's you can change lives. I think you can save like eight people every time, assuming all of your organs yeah. are able to be used. Um, there's, there's, there's skin, liver, heart. I mean, you're not going to need it where you're going. <laughs> so, That's right. Um, I just want to encourage that. Um, yeah. And I want hey, to, I, I want to say something real quick about yes. that. So I was interviewed by Kentucky Oregon donor affiliates here in Kentucky, and I was on TV, and this was before transplant. And so I didn't think I could be an organ donor because I was taking cancer type medicine uh, to slow the progression down of the pulmonary fibrosis. So I went on TV and they point blank asked me, well, Mike, you're an organ donor, aren't you? And I'm like mortified because I'm like, uh, no. And I said, I didn't think I could be. And they said, sure, you're, you can give your eyes, your skin, you know, whatever. And I'm like, sign me up right now because I don't want to be embarrassed after this thing airs. So I, I went up and signed up right then and there. So, yeah. And how do people sign up? I mean, mine's on my driver's license. I did it there. Right. And they also can go to uh, donatelife.org, I think it is. Okay. Um, I'll touch that. So okay. there is a, uh, there's a website where you can sign up as well. Awesome. So I know we've gone long and I don't want to cut anything out of this. So I don't have to divide it or just put it out there because uh, it's, it's amazing. Every single piece of it is amazing. Um, and I just want to, on the way out, if you could just give one last final parting word, and then I want to pray over our guests, our listeners rather. Sure. Heavenly Father, we thank you not only that I could share this experience of, of you taking me to heaven and meeting my donor, but Lord, that really it's all about you, Jesus. And I just pray that every word that was spoken today, that people would come to realize heaven is real, that you orchestrate our lives from beginning to end. Nothing goes unnoticed, Lord, and you provide in ways that beyond what we could even imagine or think. So Lord, I pray that everyone who listened today and, and would come away with that realization of heaven is, Lord, tangible, that as in heaven, so on earth, as we pray in the, in the Our Father, as in heaven, so on earth, that we are, are citizens of heaven, Lord, that you send angels to those who are heirs of salvation, Lord, you also send forth, uh, Lord, th things to guide us and help us uh, in tangible ways, Father. And that all comes from your heavenly resources, your heavenly kingdom. Mm -hmm. So, Lord, I just pray that you would uh, just manifest yourself in the coming weeks and days in people's lives. Take away fear, anguish, and uncertainty and replace it with hope and joy and, and anticipation for what you can do in our lives in Jesus name. Oh, amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much for today. I just blessed, so blessed. And I look forward to your movie that will be coming out at some point. I just know it's coming and I'm so yeah. excited. And uh, I just encourage you, uh, anyone that's listening, if you have a miracle that you would like to share with me, uh, remember our testimony, God can use in such a powerful way. So thank you for listening today. A uh, huge blessing. And um, reach out to me if you have um, a testimony. Uh, Everyday Miracles Podcast at gmail.com is my direct email or my website, Everyday Miracles Podcast.com. And uh, God bless you. Thanks for watching today. Mm -hmm.